Sexual Abuse Prevention. In this presentation, we will discuss why child-serving organizations should establish guidelines and protocols to protect children from sexual abuse. This will include examples of behaviors that could be considered grooming. We will provide information on how to respond to a child that discloses possible sexual abuse and how to make the mandatory report to authorities. Anyone might be a child abuser. Abusers can be found across all demographic groups. They often rely on people being uncomfortable with challenging the inappropriate behavior that is seen. Abusers often seek out organizations that focus on children, making the child a victim of opportunity. Abusers often feel that the child might be sexually interested in them and that the sexual contact causes no harm to the child. It is often difficult to identify an individual as an abuser, especially when he or she is, appears to be a dedicated member of the community and usually in positions of authority over children. A coach, a Girl Scout, Boy Scout leader, teachers, adult caregivers, daycare providers, or clergy. Grooming is begun by the abuser as a slow and gradual process. This allows for the inappropriate behavior to seem normal to the child. It also establishes trust with the child, which can then cause confusion in the child at, at the time of abuse. The abusers often build relationships with the adults around the child, which allows adults to trust the abuser to be alone with them. The abusers often seek out children who are craving adult attention. After the abuser establishes trust, they begin testing boundaries. Apparent accidental touching is common, for example, brushing up against the child during their interactions, progressing to accidental touching of the face, breasts, or private area. This creates confusion in the child, and the child may feel responsible for the touching. The abuser creates a feeling of obligation to the offender, often through gifts, comments, or special opportunities. This feeling of obligation and sense of responsibility for the touching manipulates the child into becoming cooperative with the abuse. It is important to understand that no one behavior indicates that an individual is an abuser, but more than one behavior in combination could be concerning. Behaviors might include becoming overly interested in a specific child. The abuser might frequently initiate times to be alone with the child. They might give special privileges to the child that other children in a group might not get. They will often befriend the family of the child, becoming a trusted mentor or support to the family. This allows them to create opportunities to be alone with the child and times to be with the child outside of the professional relationship. The abuser might intentionally walk in on the child, changing clothes, showering, or using the restroom. They might tell sexually explicit jokes or show sexually expl explicit images, pornography to the child. They may tease the child about gender or breast development. They might ba bathe or shower with the child. The abuser might share stories about sexual activities, trying to make the child more familiar or comfortable with the sexual behaviors. If it doesn't look or feel right, it probably isn't. It is important for organizations that serve children to develop policies and procedures intended to prevent abuse from occurring. If abuse does occur, the organization must be prepared to respond. Having procedures in place builds public trust with that organization. It also creates accountability and can reduce organization liability. It ensures that proper resources are allocated to working with our children so no one individual has the ability to have easy access to a potential victim. Ultimately, having policies and procedures in place protects the children, the employees, and the volunteers. Dr. Debbie Lindsay, a forensic pediatrician, stated that youth-serving organizations need to realize, first of all, that sexual abuse is a pervasive problem. They need to realize that the clientele that they may be serving often will have needs or issues that may make them attractive to individuals who have a propensity to abuse. Policies and protocols protect the children and employees. They also create less risk of misinterpretation of behaviors. It's important to think of what your organization does currently. What is the culture of, in your organization regarding abuse and reporting abuse if it were to occur? What are the risks to your organization that would allow abuse to occur or behaviors to be misinterpreted? How does an organization minimize those risks? If you do not have a plan, it's important to develop a multi-team member approach to creating a policy. It might be helpful to reach out to similar agencies to seek insight into what policies have been put into place already. Several organizations have realized need for policies after the Jerry Sandusky incident, where abuse occurred but there was no organizational policy in place for reporting. Thus, the abuse continued and further children were victimized. It is important to develop a safety plan within your family. We are taught to develop a safety plan in the case of fire, yet do not think to create a prevention plan for sexual abuse. During sleepovers, it's important to be aware of where the children will be, who will be supervising, and who else might be in the home or show up. There is an increased risk for abuse when a non-related male caregiver is in the home. It's also important to be aware of what your child is doing in social media. This can be a starting point for the grooming process. 
If at any time someone has been accused of sexual abuse, do not leave your child alone with that individual. Sexual abuse is very difficult to prove, so just because someone was not investigated or charged does not mean that the accusation did not have some validity. Be smart in considering your child's safety. When a child discloses sexual abuse, they are at a vulnerable place. It is essential that you believe the child. Support the child. Do not panic. Do not over- or underreact, and do not communicate blame. It is also important to not ask detailed questions. Allow the authorities to investigate. Once you have enough information to su suspect abuse, you need to make a report. Avoid making promises to the child. You will not be able to guarantee results of an investigation, so it will be important to not give promises that are not able to be fulfilled. Provide support to the child for being able to disclose. Most importantly, it is essential, and the law, that you report the disclosure to authorities for assessment and investigation. If you have any reason to suspect that the child is being sexually abused, you have a legal obligation to report it to the authorities. In order to make a report in the state of Indiana, contact Child Protective Services at 1-800-800-5556. If you have any concerns about the immediate safety of the child, contact your local law enforcement agency or call 911.